Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Our guest today is Adam Lane Robinson, the co-founder and CEO at Get Emails, the world's first ever email-based retargeting software. He's also the co-founder and president of Robly, an email marketing firm. This former Wall Streeter turned to entrepreneurship after several unique experiences made him realize that it's what he was made for. In this fascinating talk, you'll hear about what made Adam want to become an entrepreneur, how to validate your idea, how to determine when to pivot, how to come up with new ideas to test, three great tools you can use to measure user behavior and test hypotheses, and much more. So let's give Adam a warm welcome. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for taking the time to sit down with us today. I really appreciate it. I know it's early morning for you. Uh, so welcome to the show, Adam. Thank you. You know, you wouldn't know by the backgrounds that it was early morning for me and late night for you. It looks like we're like next door to each other. <laughs> we're in the same building. Yeah. So before we get started, why don't you tell everyone real fast, you know, who you are, what you do right now, and uh, we'll take it from there. Sure. My name is Adam Robinson. Um, I'm currently the founder and CEO of one company and the founder and president of another company. The The company I'm operating right now is called getemails.com. It's currently January 4th, 2021. We started Get Emails in November of 2019. So it's like 13 and a half months old. My other company is called Robly Email Marketing. I have a CEO that runs that. Uh, and it's an email marketing service like MailChimp. Um, and I started that, launched the product in 2014, came up with the idea for it in the middle of 2012. And before that, I was a credit default swap trader at Lehman Brothers. And for those who are old enough to have been alive during the financial crisis, it's the bank that defaulted because of what we were trading, <laughs> more or less. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I think everyone listening is probably old enough to remember the 2008 crisis. I just say that because... I'm surprised at the response from some people. They're like sort of glazed over. I think if you were young enough, it maybe didn't affect you in a way that was like meaningful. It certainly affected me. <laughs> I'm 40 though. I mean. So I'm 34 and. Yeah, like you're, you, were, you were around for it. I left in the summer of 2008. So it didn't really touch me because I didn't have any debt. I didn't have any assets. I didn't have stocks. I, I had nothing. Well, more importantly, you weren't looking for a job in America. Well, so I actually went to Asia because I wanted to experience something different. I've talked about this many times, so I won't, I won't say it again here. But a lot of my friends that stayed ended up screwed hard. A lot of them had student loan debt before this happened. They couldn't find work. They had to move back in with their parents. They ended up going to get a master's degree, a lot of them, because what else was there to do? Like, oh, well, I've got debt. Might as well have more debt. Oh my gosh. it's Yeah, it's a sad thing that this country is doing that to our... You know, there's a couple of really weird things about America. The student debt thing and the healthcare thing are just like, it doesn't make any sense. But like, there's no logical solution either right like you're preaching to the choir so did you get into entrepreneurship because of 2008 or were you already thinking of an exit before the real reason the real because is i graduated from college in 2003 i went to rice university in houston moved to new york worked for lehman brothers and i was living with these guys in my first apartment in new york who started Vimeo and College Humor in the apartment we were living in. So like that Vimeo, like, I don't know, it was like a top 10 website on the internet at one point. Like this is like a real 
thing these guys were doing, you know? It wasn't quite like starting Facebook, but like these guys, they were working in this really cool apartment with really young people. And like, then they moved to this amazing office in Union Square and it like just looked so cool. The job that I had was also awesome, but it was awesome because, you know, it, it was very smart and talented people that were doing it. But like at the end of the day, it's kind of like trading is like taking money out of the system for you. And like, there's no building. Like I never interviewed anybody in 10 years being there. I never managed anybody. Like I had a couple trading assistants. It was entrepreneurial in a way because like you either succeeded or you got fired. But there wasn't this idea that like, you know, you're slowly peeling back layers of the onion and you like, you know, years go by and you look back on what you've accomplished and it's like, wow, that's amazing. Like I looked back and I was like, wow, I made a lot of money, way more than I thought. <laughs> but like, that's kind of where it ended. You know, you buy things with that money. It's like, wow, I have a cool car now. But human psychology is very funny. Like you get used to all that stuff in about 90 days. The why is I wanted my life to be like these guys. It just seemed like they were getting much more out of their work than I was. So I always had this ambition. And I think before, when I was like in high school and early in college, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was like reading books about it and stuff. And then the whole Wall Street thing, it was just fixed income was like when I graduated, it was like really big. Young guys were doing really well played basketball in college and like they loved this like college athlete thing you know it was a very it was a similar environment to college sports so one of my buddies had an internship at Goldman Sachs over the summer and he's like you got to come up here and do this stuff so that's how that started I mean now it's like a lot easier for young people to just be like I'm gonna go start tech startups and be an entrepreneur like in 2003 that was not an option like nobody was like Zuckerberg did it but that was Zuckerberg like he's pretty good it was not an option to just be a startup person and go out there and raise money with zero experience, like 22 years old. If it was, I think I would have like taken that path instead of the Wall Street path, but there was no straight arrow direction to doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've spoken to a lot of people who are in their 40s and 50s who have gone through this entrepreneurial path. And uh, so it's been really interesting hearing about what business was like before the internet and how you did sales by going to people's offices and just meeting them face to face and closing them. And so it's it's been really cool to hear all these different stories. I'm curious, is anyone from your family an entrepreneur, meaning like your father, mother, aunts, uncles, grandparents, anyone like that? My mother's side of the family, like her mother was a teacher, but like her whole side of her family owned a bunch of newspapers in Oklahoma. And we like would go to family reunions with these people. I can't even articulate what I thought was so interesting about it. But like the newspaper to me seemed like like the idea that somebody we knew was controlling that. <laughs> was just this crazy idea. You know what I mean? Like, like it seemed like such a, like the Houston Chronicle, like where I grew up, it just seems like such a beast of a thing. You know, it's like, it, it was just such an interesting idea that some puppet master was up there doing it all, right? Like that's probably the closest person to an entrepreneur that I knew. And then uh, I went, my brother, like when I was still in college, he started a company and it grew a lot. And like, so I watched, I kind of watched that as I was living with my friends. Um, he's only 15 months older than me. So it wasn't like I grew up with it, but like somehow we both got infected with this idea that like, this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to be our own bosses and like all that stuff. I think being a trader was as close as you could get to being your own boss. I mean, these guys did not offer you any help or assistance or anything. It's just like thrown into the fire, you sink or swim. And if you sink, you die, you know? Well, that's probably a pretty good lesson. So I've, I've talked to a lot of people uh, in the past uh, guests on the show. And a lot of them have a father or a mother or a grandparent. So uh, it's interesting that you didn't really have that influence uh, directly because a lot of them will say, I worked in the business with them as a kid. And so that was like their inspiration. I wish I had that. I know people that have that. I think it's great. And now I think, you know, we're talking about we both just got married. I don't have kids yet. You know, I've got a friend here whose family owns a coffee company. They own a bunch of commercial real estate in Austin. And like, he still works in this family business. And like, that idea is cool. And a friend of mine growing up, his dad bought them vending machines so that they could understand how money worked. You know, like, I kind of wish I had an education like that. If God blesses us with kids, I want, I would love to like have something like that. Cause it's, I think it's helpful for the kids to understand how this stuff works. Right. Like in business on any level, like, 
Slightly more sophisticated than the lemonade stand, I think. I'll do a side note here because I haven't said this on air yet, but yes, I did just get married uh, in December, so it is exciting. Congrats. Thank you. So putting that aside now, if ever I say my wife, people won't go, wait a minute, you have a wife and a girlfriend? Wait a minute, what? So let's get a little bit closer to the topic, which is validating ideas and things like that. So what gave you the idea for your first company? So I think this is probably like a really hard one for a lot of people that want to be entrepreneurs. Cause like, where do you even start? I had this massive problem and like my solution, which didn't end up being a good one because I basically set aside a pile of money that I made. And I was like, instead of going to business school, I'm going to use this to try to educate myself in startups, invest in stuff and get involved with people that I thought could help me move along this journey, right? Like buy my way into situations that ultimately hopefully would would end up being a tech entrepreneur from an investor. My idea was like, and I had a guy that a sort of mentor that has caused me to, to lose a lot of money, but sort of did this at Lehman Brothers, like while he was a sales guy, he like was sort of actively involved in like a portfolio of like private equity slash venture investments. And I thought that was like really cool. When you're sitting there trading securities, that idea sounds like the coolest thing in the world. A diverse portfolio of businesses that you're sort of owning, running, whatever. I lost a ton of dough. I put money in like five things, like four of them like went to zero, you know, just. And, and the, the, the annoying thing was the stuff that I passed on, like they're literally like, billion dollar exit companies that I just got, you know, I'm like, I'm going to invest in five things. It's like the the four or the five, the four that I did were like kind of donuts, like my company is fine. And then three out of the four that I passed on, it was like plaid got bought for $5 billion. I met with them like right out of tech stars, bark box, like this guy, you know, it's worth over a billion. Like it's just, I'm so stupid. I'm such a bad investor. So anyway, this was my idea. And then stupidly, you know, this is another asinine idea that I had. Cause like, I say that's a bad idea because like, I really believe in focus. There's nothing more powerful than like you focusing on one thing and multiple things are distracting. The less you focus on, the more you can sort of make it happen. And then if you get many smart people focusing on one thing, razor sharp focus, like you can, you can build some pretty amazing stuff over the course of a lot of years. The first thing that actually worked was this company called Robly email marketing. And the, where it came from is my brother, was using a company called RatePoint for email marketing and customer reviews. And they shut it down. This guy had raised $25 million and they just turned the lights off. And he's like, you're looking for something to do. Why don't we try to build this software on the cheap and go find this guy's customers? Which sounded like a reasonable enough idea to me. You know, he raised 25 million bucks. He bought a bunch of customers. They no longer have a product to use. Let's see if we can move quick, build a product, find them, and then see what's next. And this guy actually found the CEO of the company that shut down. He found a video that I made trying to go after his customers and emailed me. And he's like, hey, man, come to Boston. Like, if you try to do what you're doing, you're going to fail. I can show you something that will for sure at least get you to like a small lifestyle business and then you can figure out what's next. Music to my ears. First time entrepreneur. I'm like, okay, cool. So this guy's like, I'm not going to say too much, but there's a company up the road that does email marketing. They're leaving a ton of customer information all over the internet. And this was like this predated, like built with and datanized. So built with is like, you know, for this new company you're starting, when you prospect people, you can go on there and like see everyone that uses software X, like MailChimp, right? Everyone that has it. And they, they, they scan people's websites and they look for like subscription widget, widgets or like JavaScript, right? So they have just, you, you can get lists of companies that are lists of domains that use these technologies. And from there, you can go find their emails and you can prospect them. This predated that. And we were able to find a couple hundred thousand of this company's customers who I can't name because of a lawsuit settlement. We built a pr price and performance competitive product. And we first like started trying to direct mail these people to get them to like get on our platform because we spoke to a marketing person who did a direct mail campaign at the other company. We were like, oh, this is going to be amazing. We're going to send these mailers out. We're going to convert them at 10%, like this woman said that we we would. And we're going to get 2,000 customers in our first 60 days paying us $15. And like, instead of 2,000, it was like 15, <laughs> like, which is another hilarious thing about starting SaaS startups, like your idea of how it's going to go before you actually start and then how it actually goes. Like I came up with this philosophy about starting companies during that first experience. It's like, 
if I can't afford for this to go 10% as well as I'm modeling, I'm not going to start it because <laughs> it's probably going to go 10% as well as I think in the beginning. And then it'll once everything, you know, once you get some product market fit, it like can increase. So the direct mail thing didn't work. And then, you know, we started cold calling this list of people because we were able to find the business name, zip code, and first and last name of the person who actually had the account. And from there, we sent this list overseas. They popped it into to Google. They sent us back a phone number. I was running this out of my apartment because like, as I said before, like my, I had this ambition. I wanted to create this company in this apartment like these guys did. It just seemed so cool. At one point, I had 39 smile and dial callers coming to my apartment. It was absurd. It was like rows of screens and people on headsets. And the problem with it was it was a finite strategy, right? There was only some, once I got through that list, there was nothing after it. We thought we had another list. This was the worst thing that I've done as a leader. We tested this other list and it looked like it was going to work. And it was like a million leads. We had like 200,000. So I was like, oh, great. It's going to, it's not going to be as good of a list, but like we'll at least double and get a little more on top of what we had. And then we got all these people and we were ramping, like I hired this real recruiter. We were, we had an intern program, you know, you're doing all this ridiculous stuff. You have to hire five, 10 people every month or something like that. Like you start trying to compete with all these other companies that are hiring these smile and dialers out of college or whatever in New York, get everybody on the list. People aren't even pick up the phone. You know, it's so far from economic that like literally had to call everybody into a room and be like, if you're in this room, you're fired and went from like 39 to six in one day because there was no business. It just wasn't even close to economic on a unit economic basis to continue doing what we're doing there. The nice thing was it was cash flow positive with 39 people. So like you go down to six and it's like a lot cash flow positive, but like the problem was it's not growing anymore because the growth was coming from all of those salespeople. So yeah, that's the, the brief story of like year one through two and a half of Robley which was that ended in 2016. That was like when that date was. And there was just a lot of messing with stuff to figure out how to get these people to buy it. So would you say that was the hardest thing you learned was figuring out how to get people to buy it? There were just so many lessons that came from that. If we're talking about like things that I will forever avoid in the future, like the hardest thing that I ever had to do was fire all those people at once. After ramping up on a decision that I had made, right? Like, like what lesson came from that? Like, I don't know. I was probably, it's very easy. And with this new company, I'm sure you will see like separating your emotion from this thing that's growing in front of you is like such a difficult thing. It's, you know, especially like these people that you're hiring, it's a, it's a vanity metric. Like it's, it's horrible. It's not, it does not sign of a company doing well. Right. But like it does something to your soul when over the course of six months, your company goes from six to 39 people. If the people are growing faster than the revenue, even it still makes you feel like the business is like growing super fast because it's just in front of your eyes. It went from six to 39 people and it's a totally different thing. That was probably a great lesson. My personal attitude towards it now is that less people and more revenue is the goal, <laughs> right? Like at that point, that was not necessarily the case. It was, I was, I, it was very exciting and fulfilling seeing this thing grow with headcounts in front of my very eyes. I heard someone say like, yeah, we grew from 50 to 2000 over the last like three years. I'm like, why do I ever want to have a company with 2000 people? If I could have the same company with 200, I don't even want to have a company with 200. There are some situations in which I would accept that. I like where we're at now. We started this company last November. We got to 3 million in revenue in 12 months. We have five full-time employees. I think we'll be able to double this year, at least maybe a little bit more without hiring anybody. And that's a really good business, you know, and like it will be valuable at the end of this year and somebody will buy that for some eight figure number. It's so pleasant. Like when you have a company, with 40 people and you're trying to hire 10 people a month, you have to start doing things like, oh, if we had a book club and we we're in a kickball league and we had kombucha on tap, then we're going to be able to hire these people from Yelp and Yext, right? 
Whereas like if you have five people and they all have skin in the game and they're all smart, like that doesn't even remotely enter the equation. Right. And if you have to like hire one other really key person, like they're interested in the fact that your company grew from zero to three million in 12 months and like don't give a shit about the kombucha. Right. Like they're like, wow, we could really make this thing, you know, we could like create a hundred million dollars in value over the next couple of years. And like I could be one of the six people who did that. One way to avoid all of that stuff is to just have a fully remote team because you can't have kombucha if they don't have an office. <laughs> Lehman Brothers like was 20,000 people, but I was on a 13 person team and like we didn't really even know the people next to us on like that 13 person team. You know, it was just this row of people and like we were a tight unit. That doesn't even count culturally, but like it seemed like going from five to 10 was some added complexity. If like you're the one like right now, I think between the two companies, we have 20, but there's a CEO of Robley who handles 15 of them. So like I don't consider that part of my headache anymore. I kind of have a headache of like a five person organization with get emails, which is beautiful. 10, depending on how you set it up and how many people you're speaking to directly. Like if you're speaking to like three people and that's it, then 10 is not too bad. But like there becomes a point that's like maybe above 30 where you've had to put all of the management layers in that you would if you had like a 100 or 200 person company. Bureaucracy and politics enter this organization that just suck. Like it's just, you're spending time on stuff that is not what you want to spend time on. But you know, you kind of have to have it to grow in certain situations. Other people are more ambitious than me. Like I'm happy selling early, you know, and staying small in order to do that, um, to like start a new one and do the same thing. Like, like I really love building in the early state, like super early stages, finding original product market fit, testing it, you know, getting to whatever three, five, I mean, 10 in revenue or something like that. And then just like getting rid of it, starting over. Like that's my, what I think I'm interested in right now, rather than like, man, we got to make this thing a billion dollar company. That's what we're doing. We're going big. We're going on raising VC. That's just a different way to do it. Right. And that involves heads. There's no way you're getting around heads. Let's talk a little bit more about, uh, you, you shared about the process you went through in testing different ways to validate your market and get people to pay for your, your product for Robly. Why don't we take a step back and talk about the thought process and the planning and the strategy for how to figure out what's the first thing to do if it doesn't work what's the next thing to do and et cetera, et cetera, until you hit that fit there's a great book called the four steps to the epiphany that i would recommend anybody who's starting a startup read i just agree with this philosophy about building things the philosophy is this and and i think a lot of a lot of startups that do really well the guy has done this and he didn't even realize that he was doing it really. A lot of people have heard of the lean startup. This book is like the academic version of the book that the lean startup sort of like distilled into something that you could, you know, read in a day or whatever. But the idea is this, the, the root human flaw that this guy is saying we all have that's wrong is that uh, your intuition is often a horrible indicator of market validity. So instead of building something, thinking that there's buyers for it, and then marketing it on this big launch when you're done building it, you need to find the buyer. You need to come up with a product hypothesis and then start building that product. And as you're building it, you need a separate team going out there and making sure there's actually demand for what you're building. And he's got all these steps. And if you make it to a certain step and you're not above a certain threshold, you have to stop and you have to pivot. You have to change your product hypothesis and start the whole process over again. And he's, he's a stickler about like, it's not about adding features to this product hypothesis that you thought you had. Like you can't change anything until you stop and start over again. So anyway, I think that this is the way to do it. In a way, my Robley experience was that. Like I said before, a lot of people end up doing that without even knowing, like we had another guy who had done exactly what we did at Robley before we did it. We had a guy who used, found this list, used it, called these customers, got them to switch over with a half price product that did the same thing. There was just a ton of evidence that that was true and that happened. There was a customer discovery before we started building. We didn't actually do it, but somebody had done it. And he's like, I know this works because I literally just did it. Fast forwarding with Get Emails, it started off as a feature in Robley. 
Like I couldn't figure out how to compete with MailChimp because they spend a billion dollars a year in advertising. Their brand's amazing and they sell a free product that people don't realize isn't free until they've been on it for, you get it. Anyway, that's a whole story in itself. Get emails was meant to be a feature of Robly that actually got people to switch to Robly. I'm like, okay, how do we do this customer discovery again? So we started with our own customers, which was nice, but didn't end up being the perfect buyer for this get emails thing. Tremendous evidence that there was demand for this. And how could there not be demand for more email addresses of people that were on your website, right? Like intuitively, that's a no-brainer value proposition. I sent an email out to our customers. I'm like, hey, we're going to have this in a month. Who's interested? And like out of like 4,000 paying customers, like 200 people said yes to an email. That's a great sign. And then, you know, we started sort of drilling down into like, why they thought they needed it, you know, what they were willing to pay for it. The direct and indirect competitors to this product were that they were currently using. The interesting thing was we put it, what we didn't realize is for people that were not already using Robly, they didn't want to switch to Robly. It was a deal break. You know, they were signing up for Robly using this get emails product, downloading the file, putting it in their email marketing app. They still thought it was a great product, right? So what does that tell you? I should probably spin it out and connect it to everything because if I did, then people might think it was a great product and not just, I mean, because they thought it was a good product and they were willing to endure this horrible user experience, which typically is a good sign of product market fit, right? When somebody's just like, oh man, this is awesome. Even though you're making me download a file and importing it and and export and import in my, my other app every day. All that is to say, we were listening, we were talking to as many people as humanly possible, trying to get indicators that people were interested in this stuff, observing very closely how people were using it, and then just like, you know, making these tiny steps forward. That's great. That worked. I did two other things before that, which were large time and financial investments trying to grow the core ESP business that did not work at all. (laughs) Right? So But I was trying to do the same thing, you know, it's just, I got farther in the process, you know, there weren't nearly as good of early indicators that there were demand for them. One was I was basically, I was trying to do everything MailChimp wasn't doing. I'm like, what are they not doing? Right? Because they are doing some stuff and they're not doing other stuff. What they're doing, they're doing unbelievably well. So what are they not doing? And I thought that they maybe weren't focused on larger customers, which was true. But the problem was there were like a bunch of other people that were already going after that business, which like I found out nine months later after trying to build a whole other software. And then I tried to take over a partner program from a very large email marketing company that was like the pioneer, but MailChimp usurped after they got acquired and cut it. And after about nine months of doing that, realized that that was just like a branding effort for them. And on a unit, unit economic basis, it didn't work at all. And a company as small as us couldn't afford to do something like that. So that was the two years in between get emails and probably flatlining. Well, I think we've all had our uh, our failures and all that. I mean, I, I spent a year and a half uh, with Sidekick building something that then I realized, while it's great, I need a tremendous, like I, I, I was partially down the fintech line and would need... 30 or $50 million to become compliant in various jurisdictions because we were dealing with cryptocurrencies as well. And I just, I said, no, there, there's no way I don't have, I don't have the desire to do that. I don't want to deal with the compliance. And so I'm just going to change. So you mentioned that you were observing the users. How exactly did you observe them in order to get those indicators of what you were doing was right or wrong? Because when you say to them something and they respond to you back, saying something is different than doing something. From psychology, I know that people are very good at basically either lying to your face to make you feel good or not really understanding their own behavior in order to give you the correct information you need. And so you have to observe their behavior in order to see what they actually want. So, so how did you observe that? So there's a few tools to do this. Fortunately, we have someone who's really good at product who like ran Robly for me for a few years. And like the user of Robly makes you really good at product because they're like a really unsophisticated person. So like you have to design things in a way where it's impossible, impossible to misunderstand. There's tools that help great product people. Full story is a great one. You can literally watch the sessions, right? 
full story, write that down. Um, and they have a startup program. It's not cheap, but it's not that expensive. It's like a couple thousand bucks a year and you can watch video sessions of your users. So that is, man, when you've made your first cut at UI, it's amazing to watch people explain to you through their clicks how bad you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's a great one. One thing that like we have tried to employ a couple times and never successfully, and I don't know why, like maybe it's just because like we never had like a really mass market product in the sense that we didn't have enough people coming through to where I felt like the data coming out of it was like statistically significant. But things like mix panel or amplitude, these are meant for product people to observe basically where people are getting hung up going through the activation and conversion process. So you send events to these softwares and then you create different funnels and you basically try to look through data, right? So like 78% of people got to this point, 32% of people got to this point. Last week it was 35, what did you change, right? So like you're trying to like look at cohorts. So of the people that started four weeks ago with this feature set, versus the people that started eight weeks ago with that feature set. Like, how are they moving through these funnels week by week and point by point differently? And that is supposed to make you able to iterate on feature sets in a product and over time, hopefully improve it. Another thing that I just try to do, it's like get the product people on the phone with customers as much as humanly possible. And you do have this problem where um, sometimes people lie to you. And a lot of times the people who are willing to take time to talk are not necessarily the people that you want to be talking to. <laughs> you know, they're not your power user. In my opinion, you're trying to do is you're trying to get inside the brain of this person and figure out how they work or like what, you know, it's B2B. If it's B2C, it's whatever you're helping them with in their life, but like how they're actually doing whatever they're doing that relates to the problem you're trying to solve. So that I would say is how you observe, right? One is you literally watch them through full story. Two, if you can get good at this, like I said, we haven't really been able to use something like mixed panel and amplitude, but that's pretty advanced. So that's like farther along. And then three, which is critically important in early stages, just talk, I mean, talk to as many people as, as humanly possible. So do you think through using these kinds of services that it's possible to get enough information to decide whether or not you should pivot or continue down the road? The biggest motivation to pivot would be my tip top of the funnel. I just can't even get people to care. Does that make sense? Like whoever I'm trying to talk to about this, they are unenthusiastic and they are not willing to give me the time even to try my thing. Get emails, we had a little bit of like the other problem in the beginning, like everybody was willing to try it. And they were so excited for the first six weeks. But unless you were a really talented email marketer, a small business couldn't make the emails convert. Very sophisticated email marketers can because the emails are cheap. But like, if you're not good at converting on email, it's never gonna work. So I would say, however you're creating demand, even if it's in the beginning and you're like literally manually finding your first 10 customers, which like, you know, if you read this Y comment or stuff like that's what you do. You find people by hand to, to like who are your, you think are your ideal people and however you do it, you find them. And it's usually over a format like this. It's a video call now, right? You can see in someone's face if they care, which is why I love video calls, right? Over the phone, it's more difficult. I'll just quickly go back to like uh, I mentioned, I tried to create an enterprise email marketing application. We went to a trade show. I pulled this big stunt and we're going around talking to people about this and like no one gave a shit. You know what I mean? Like it was so evident that these people did not care about what I was telling them that I was selling. I didn't even know how to do the get emails thing yet. I just knew that there it was a possibility that I could. And I was like, by the way, I can do this other thing. And Literally, eyes light up, ears perk up. What did you say you could do? You could get me email addresses off of my website of people that didn't fill out forms. Like, yes, I am interested in that. Call me when you have that. And I kind of think, I don't know if you agree with this or not. It's like, you give me top of funnel of a certain type of person that I know that I can reach and continue to get signing up for my free trial. 
I'll figure out how to build something that moves them through this funnel. And then there's like a retention problem at the end. But then again, it kind of all works hand in hand, right? Like you need an end result to tell people to get them to sign up for your thing in the first place. And that end result usually is a combination of like features or whatever. I'm typically pivoting when the core of what I'm doing, I can't get people excited about it. Or I have evidence that like with the partner program, it was like the evidence eventually surfaced that it just wasn't going to work on a unit economic basis. Like they were all excited about doing it, but it was like, eh, like this doesn't work for me. If you can't go find the customers systematically, eventually you got to stop building what you're building and go come up with something else that you can build where you could find customers systematically because how are you going to do it, right? I think you got pretty lucky that you had this other idea, even if you didn't know how to do it yet, uh, that you were like, oh, by the way, I think that's really cool. But I think a lot of people probably don't have that backup idea. So if somebody is in a situation where they're trying something and it doesn't work and they realize they need to pivot, how can they very quickly figure out what that next thing might be? By the way, this other idea, let me tell you how pie in the sky it was. And it just sounded amazing to me. And I had no idea how to do it. Like, I didn't know how to do this for two years. I wanted to do this and had no idea how to do it for two years. Had no, no idea any other vendors that sold it or whatever. This guy I know who has this company called Bounce Exchange, he called me up. They were looking to buy a company like Robly, but a different type of one, a much more sophisticated e-commerce focused email marketing application. And he told me about this identity resolution stuff that he was doing. He acquired a company out of Techstars that had this. And he's like, yeah, man, we can tell you who's on your website and find email addresses for it. It just got into my head. And I was like, man, like if I could do that, I could sell that to anybody, you know, but just like had no idea how, just no clue. And it wasn't like I went into that trade show thinking that it was a backup idea. You know, it was just something that I thought, sounded amazing. How couldn't somebody want that? Right. And so I got to this trade show. It was very depressing, like extremely deflating. I was spending all this money on the smooth and all this crap and no one cared. And like, it was just something that like popped out of my mouth spontaneously. I was like, okay, these people don't give a shit about an investment or, or a big email marketing application. Let me see if they care about this other thing that I think is cool. And I've never heard of all that is to say, I would just encourage people to kind of keep their ears to the ground. You know, it's like you have conversations with a lot of people doing a lot of different stuff, just doing it, right? Like we're talking right now. I'm learning from you, you're learning from me, right? So I would just always keep your ears open. Like even right now, for me, I I know that this get emails thing is not my end all be all. There's a lot of reasons I don't wanna be in this business for like 10 years. One, the legal aspect is very unclear. You know, it's only legal in the U.S. Like, I don't know how long it will be. Maybe it'll be forever. Maybe it'll be for five years. Maybe it'll be for two years. Who knows, right? There's a few other things that I don't like about it. Like right now, I'm trying to figure out, I love the market that it's in in general, right? Not everybody knows it exists. It's very cool, this identity resolution stuff in general. It's like trying to talk to as many people as possible about different things people are doing in this data world, right? Because I believe that data is the new gold, you know? When I hear something that's like, wow, that sounds awesome. Like it's in the back of my mind, you know, and I'm kind of like always talking to people about like, oh, like, what about this? What about this? And I think this is part of the way I've kind of beaten it into myself to do this customer discovery. I'm like constantly sort of bouncing ideas off of people to to just learn, you know, in a battle that we're having right now, which I think is very similar, like get emails what it was last year and got us to this point. We're not doing it. We're trying to sell a totally different thing to people this next year than we were to a different group of people. We sold to e-commerce companies last year. We're trying to sell to people who use what's called a customer data platform this year. And I don't even know if this is going to work. So if it doesn't work, we're going to try something else. Luckily, we have this cash cushion and we can afford to experiment, which I highly recommend if it's possible to other entrepreneurs to do. So the idea is we want to sell to bigger customers because the bigger they are, the better they are, the lower they're going to churn, like all this stuff. Like I have to figure out whether our hypothesis about this CDP and whether enriching this data for these people whose goal is to get as much data as possible, if that's actually true or if there's something that I don't know about their job that is making it impossible, right? So 
all of this is to say, it's not like it was even a real backup idea at that point. You know, it was just something that it was in my head that was like, man, that sounds cool. And I think as an entrepreneur, you should kind of always be trying to find that. Like, what, you know, what's cool out there? Who's doing stuff that's making people's lives better, you know, that I think is awesome. What's something I haven't asked you that you wish I would ask? Here's a good question. You know, as a person who started being an entrepreneur eight years ago versus who you are now, what are some of the philosophical changes that have occurred in your psyche in that period of time? And I have some good answers. Yeah, I have some good answers for this because my girlfriend started her own company last year. Yeah, my wife. <laughs> my wife started her own company last year and like, you know, I just find myself very subtly like telling her these anecdotes of things that I did that I'm sort of seeing her do, you know, that I think a lot of people do because, you know, your friends come and talk to you about stuff. And like, so a major one, I think, is if you can sort of get yourself to not do things that you know you have to do, but don't do them until the last possible minute. And when I'm talking about things, it's like you think you need an LLC. You don't actually need an LLC unless your company's working. So like, don't go out there and spend time and money creating. It makes you feel good because you have this thing that you own. Just wait. Things that I did way too early. I hired someone six months before I should have. Like I, sh I hired someone for customer support before we had customers. Just because like I told her that she was going to start in October. But like your startup, like you can't forecast when that's going to happen. You can't like stand up to somebody's 60 grand a year salary when you don't have a product just because you said that you could, right? Like you'll die. Like luckily I had saved a pile of money and I didn't die, but I spent 10 times more money than I should have, right? Other things that I did, I got a phone system, right? Like I spent money decorating this office. Like what, why, you know what I mean? Like why would I do that before I knew it was going to work, right? I got an office in the first place, crazy, but like that idea is insane for you to get an office before you have a product that is making money. I think it's less insane now after COVID, but like that's something that people feel like they have to do. And like, I have friends who I still have this conversation with. It's like, bro, tell me why you think you need an office. It's like, well, I need to be able to recruit people. It's like, I don't have an office. I can recruit people just fine. <laughs> you don't need an office to recruit people, right? I bought like, I like read something, Tim Ferriss, some, some, it's like, go out and give speeches and buy cameras and like make yourself, like I bought like two Canon camera, you know, just like buying things early and like doing things early is not like wait as long as humanly possible because like how this works in the beginning, in my opinion, is like, you are so unfamiliar with the territory that you're navigating. And the analogy is like, you're kind of blind, right? And like what you think that you see if you take, oftentimes, if you take like three steps forward, you're like the, the fog. <laughs> it's like you're looking at something totally different than when you were three steps back. And also there's this idea that like cash in the beginning is this like lifeline. It's like life and death, right? So you just need to conserve cash as much as humanly possible. That paradigm changes as you move along. But like in the beginning, especially, man, no one knows how long it's going to take to build what they're building. No one knows how many times they're going to have to take to pivot. The best guys takes them forever. Palantir was shit for four years, this fucking thing. Like, you know, and, and now they're worth $10 billion, but like they had a nothing product for like four or five years. Philosophically, number one is just like put off everything as long as humanly possible. When you absolutely have to have it, do it. Number two is I had this crazy idea and I don't know where I got it. Like my, my brother, maybe like he was like, his business salvage and refurbished electrical distribution equipment and he used the internet to do it. He did great. But like he had a warehouse full of guys that were like, you know, kind of minimum wage workers for sorting through these circuit breakers for that. He had this attitude. He's like, I'm going to make incredible systems so I can just kind of plug anybody into it. And like, it will work. But like, I think for the kind of stuff that we do, like, and I had a philosophy, I was like, I'm just going to have great systems. I'm going to great sales scripts, great CRMs, all this crap. And then I won't have to have great salespeople because they'll just be able to say the words and it'll be fine. Like, couldn't be more wrong. You want to have, and this is my opinion now, the best people you can possibly get, afford, whatever to work with you. Until you've messed up on some of these hiring decisions and you've waited way too long to fire the person, it's difficult to understand. Like, someone who is good, not only does their job, but like, 
they're pushing your organization forward with a ferocity that's inexplicable and they're unquantifiably better than a normal person who can barely do their job and everything slipping through the cracks. And like the person who's pushing it forward at the same time, maybe you're paying them 10 or 15% more than you would pay an average person. And they're happy to do it because it's just in their personality to do things like this, right? So like lesson number two is like, and I think where people mess up and they hire their friends and it's usually your friend who doesn't have a job. And there's usually a reason why your friend who doesn't have a job doesn't have a job. They're a great friend, but they're not a great worker, right? So that's where I see it the most over the years. It's like, it's really easy to do that in the beginning because you love your friends, right? They're your, they're your lifelong compadres. But like oftentimes it's not what you want from a friend and what you want from a coworker. They're very different things. Often. Those are my, those are probably the, the, the two ways I've changed the most. Well, I appreciate that those are two very fantastic answers. How can the audience follow up with you? Email me at adam at getemails.com. I'm happy to chat with anybody. I kind of love talking about this stuff, you know. Very simple. I appreciate it. So thank you for being incredibly generous with your time and your knowledge. I appreciate it. It's been a fun conversation for me. Hopefully it's been intriguing for you. Entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. If you liked this episode, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anywhere that you listen to this podcast because it really helps me to find more people like you and find great people like Adam to come and share his information, his knowledge, his experience, and his love, which is entrepreneurship. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. 